Okay, so today we are going to start with phase lock loops. So what is the motivation for phase lock loops? Is anybody exposed to PLLs before? Any of you? Okay, you are, okay. Anybody else? Okay, good, um, okay. Anyone else? Okay, so do you know, can you tell me why we do PLLs? To do phase locking of course, but yeah. Good, very good. How about you? Any? Huh? Okay, all right, sounds good. That's uh, okay. So very good. Um, uh, what Rupesh said. So motivation, first motivation, is want um, high frequency and accurate local oscillator frequency generator. That's what we want, right? Um, the point about this is. Um, we did the VCO, uh, we studied the VCO, right? And what we found was if there is even a millivolt of change in VTune, okay, what is the value of the KVCO, let us say 100 megahertz, 200 megahertz per volt, 200 megahertz per volt. And if I have a 1 millivolt change at the input, what would you get? Hmm? 200 kilohertz. Now, if 1 millivolt changes the VCO output frequency by 200 kilohertz, um, and if you remember the GSM example we did, uh, what is the band, uh, the channel bandwidth? 200 kilohertz. So if there is a 1 millivolt tick somewhere, the thing will go to the next channel, right? So not really very useful, correct? Is, is that point clear? So we need to generate um, highly accurate, um, you know, source of frequency on chip. Now you would say that, okay, get the frequency from somewhere outside maybe as you know generator but that's not possible inside your phone right you cannot have a source which is from outside in the lab setting maybe you can do so so what you generally do is um, you can use uh, everybody probably knows what a crystal is right uh, piezoelectric crystal so those have a property you can generate frequencies which are very accurate um, and very stable with temperature and uh, over time also so, uh, you know, this entire electronics industry is kind of based on that. You have a reference um, uh, crystal oscillator which gives you a few ppm type of variation um, under all conditions. Uh, ppm is parts per million type of numbers. And um, we use that crystal to start with a reference frequency and then we use the PLL to generate frequency that we want, okay, accurately. So that's what we're going to study. The second thing uh, that's important is. Um, Okay, we said we want a frequency which is very accurate to receive certain channel, but at the same time we want ability to change to the next channel, right? You cannot just have, each phone cannot be tuned to one frequency and it will be worthless, right? Because then we want to change, uh, we are even changing GSM, you know, uh, TDMA, CDMA, any kind of uh, thing you want to be, you want, you want ability to change the frequency over a wide range. I mean, if you, if you open a specification of a, of a typical phone that you buy, just open the manual and you will see that it works from 900 megahertz to 1800 megahertz and also it has ability to run from 50 uh, till 5.4 gigahertz, right? I mean all sorts of channels, all sorts of um, you know frequency range it is operating in. So you need ability to generate uh, programmable uh, you know, frequency uh, source. Basically, you need a source that's programmable, LO source. Okay, so that's the second part, which is programmability. And the third part is over time, it has to be stable. It has to be rock solid. You cannot, in the middle of the conversation, it shouldn't drift. Okay, because if you just have a VCO and you bias it, whatever, and something changes, the supply changes, the thing is going to drift all over the place. So you want ability to have it stable over, you know. I mean, today you are may are doing a conversation. Tomorrow also you should be able to do the conversation on the same channel. Okay, so those three things are the most important um, things we have to achieve. So um, we did uh, when we did the receiver structure, right? We did a uh, we did the architecture. Let me draw the picture so it will be clear why in the phase lock loop is so important in the. So the first block is called diplexer. I'm going to explain all this to you. Okay, and then uh, from diplexer, we go through a matching network, and the first stage. This is a receive path of a receiver. Okay, and um, 
of a transceiver. So, I am just drawing a generic block diagram of a transceiver. Transceiver means transmitter and a receiver in the same uh, on the same chip. The first block would be your low noise amplifier, okay. Something like this and then I have a mixer let us say and this mixer requires uh, a frequency, okay. One is sin um, omega uh, 0 t and the other one is cos omega 0 t, okay. So, we need to have these two sources and then what do we do? We just do a filtering which is our baseband filtering, okay. Uh, I am not drawing the gain stages right now, but uh, that can be part of the filter and finally, what we do is we do conversion, ADC conversion, which I think you are doing in your uh, mixed signal class, many of you, right. So, this would be your A to D converter, ADC converter, okay. So, uh, then the data goes uh, goes to the digital portion where all the mechanics of demodulation everything is taken care of, okay. All right. So, now we need to generate this frequency sin omega 0, uh, omega uh, 0 t and cos omega 0 t. These two frequencies we need to generate. So, they have to come from somewhere and what do we want? We want to have, we have one reference frequency like from a crystal, uh, stable reference crystal oscillator. So, the crystal oscillator typically is drawn this way, something like this, okay. And the crystal oscillator you will generally have a crystal is called XO and it will provide a reference clock, okay. So, the reference clock can be um, 26 megahertz, 25 megahertz, 10 megahertz, 100 megahertz. Generally, um, as you go higher in frequencies, they tend to get more expensive, the crystal oscillators. So, um, a favorite number is 26 megahertz, I have used 15 megahertz, okay, so or 16 megahertz and uh, it really does not matter what you choose there. So, let us pick a number here right now, uh, this would be let us say 26 megahertz, okay. And then this will go inside a box okay and this output of this box will be fed over here okay got it and this is called frequency synthesizer synthesizer okay so this frequency synthesizer is going to need an input which is the digital input okay what it will do is it will tell you which channel do I want to go to, is that clear? So, at a very high level this is the way the um, receiver architecture looks like and so if you if you if you will right if you now kind of you will appreciate uh, the class the way we have been talking about. We started with little bit of antenna we did some whatever is going on outside then diplexer let us ignore it it is outside component for a minute. Um, but we did matching networks, we did LNA, we did mixers right, filters you did it last year in analog class and then ADC you are doing in another class and inside the frequency synthesizer is the VCO which we did already and now we are going to do little, go a little bit higher up and we are going to talk about synthesizer, frequency synthesizer, okay. Is this part clear at a high level how this thing comes into play? So, our uh, the job of the frequency synthesizer is you get a reference frequency from outside um, like a 26 megahertz, 10 megahertz whatever you can uh, buy from a crystal uh, and the price of the crystal depends on the frequency you choose, accuracy you choose and um, I mean that technology has become like a I like to call it jelly bean part meaning you know just like you buy rice you can buy crystal oscillator I mean it is that inexpensive. Okay. So, you, you put that and that reference oscillator uh, frequency will go in and, um, and then you will uh, and the input is needs to be provided digitally to program this frequency synthesizer, okay give me 2.469 uh, you know megahertz or something like that, uh, kilo uh, gigahertz 2.469 gigahertz and then give me 2.468 gigahertz something like that. So, you can just program digitally and it will go and lock onto that frequency. Okay. And then the entire receiver works. Um, one more thing the frequency synthesizer is supposed to do again is needs to generate frequencies for ADC, A to D converter, needs a reference clock, right. So, you need to provide a reference clock over here, okay. Other thing also it needs to do is it needs to provide clock for digital circuits. Like if you have a system on a chip, then there is digital also running, that digital needs to be provided a clock and that clock needs to be synchronized with whatever clocks you are using in your receiver, right many times. So, that that can be also done. So, the synthesizer is kind of you know one of the very important pieces uh, which will determine the quality of your um, uh, transceiver, okay. So, uh, and it is it is a system by itself, 
you know, early days people would just spend, um, you know, their careers on synthesizers. I know few people who I worked with closely, uh, especially some of the inventions that were early part, I was very fortunate to work with some of the people who were pioneers and inventors in frequency synthesizer and their office was right next to mine. So I was so lucky. Uh, the person who kind of invented the fractional length synthesizer which we are going to talk about, he, I used to be next to him and you know I learned a lot from him. Uh, so, um, and, um, so anyway I was digressing. Uh, coming back to this, um, so this is what the receive path looks like. Now let us look at the transmit path which we have not done be right now but we are going to do it. Um, after um, uh, after a few classes uh, to talk about transmitter. So in the transmit part again what is going on, uh, we have again a matching network and here we are draw, draw, drawing it in a different way. So here also you have a matching network and then I am going to draw it reverse way. This is our power amplifier, okay. The power amplifier we are going to talk as part of this class also. And then the stuff which comes in before the power amplifier is very similar to uh, what happens in the receiver. So here we have plus your mixer, mixer, and here also you are doing the same thing, which is sine omega O t cos omega zero t. What are these? These are I and Q channels. Okay, and in this case also I need to provide the uh, the same synthesizer can be used to provide clock. It does not have to be yet another synthesizer. So these are provided by, uh, by the same synthesizer. Uh, I mean they, they do not need to be the same frequency either. Okay? So for example, many cases the either receiver or transmitter is on at a time. Okay? So the synthesizer needs to wake up, tune and then it needs to lock on to the receive frequency, do its job and then come in and do the transmit you know to different frequency transmit it can happen that way. So and here we have again I am drawing a very simplistic rendition of the, the transmitter. The real picture is a little more complicated than this. What is this? This is D to A converter. Are you doing uh, D to A converters in your mixed signal class many of you? Okay. So you are familiar right and this is where the data comes in now. So this data is coming in from I data and this is Q data. And here we are outputting I data and this is Q data going this way to the digital part. Pretty much uh, looks like any um, you know transceiver that, that you will find nowadays that it will look kind of like this. Okay? This whole thing can be integrated on a chip. Early days we could not do that. Early days we had to have a VCO separate chip, the inductor was outside the chip. And then uh, you know the LNA was outside, it would have 50 ohm matching matching coming in and only maybe the, the filter and the ADC were on one chip okay? and then the data would go into another chip which would be digital. Now everything is you know on one chip. So uh, and all this thing is possible because of variety of inventions which have happened in the field of first of all the, the technology has helped, CMOS has moved into giving you better, better, better FTs. Right? So, so we are able to do a lot of things on the chip plus inductors. Right? We are able to do inductors on chips as a result of which we can do VCOs on chip to generate the, uh, whatever we need. Also the next innovation is um, uh, we are able to put digital and analog on the same chip. Uh, that was quite a struggle. Um, uh, the, the first chip that I worked on um, where we put everything together, right? Um, we did not know what to expect. Uh, when we put everything together. Uh, but then uh, there were many, many uh, techniques uh, that we used which would enable us to uh, put the, put two chip, everything digital as well as heavy duty digital as well as analog on the same chip. And many of those things we have talked about, how do you handle substrate coupling, how do you handle, you know, you do fully differential structures and all those kind of things, right. So, okay. So coming back to synthesizer, right. So let us take one example here. Let us take example of a GSM case. Now in GSM 1900 case, um, the channel bandwidth is 200 kilohertz. Uh, so this is your channel spacing. Okay. So we need, uh, there is generally a specification when you, when you look at the, uh, the specification document of GSM uh, that you need LO to be accurate within let us say 100 hertz something like that, right. So um, what that means is let us say I have
So, these are variety of channels and this is the channel spacing which is 200 kilohertz. Okay. So, I should not my uh, my LO frequency reference frequency should not move uh, more than 100 hertz. Okay. Within 100 hertz we are able to do things in digital to take care of it. There is a carrier offset correction um, you know that happens in digital which will kind of take care of all those small details, but it cannot do too much. Okay. Because if you do too much variation then you are going to get the next channel on uh, coming in okay. and that will dominate your structure. Okay. So, let us take this example, uh, let us say we, uh, this is 100 hertz, right? we can say for calculation purposes we can say 190 hertz and divide by 1900 megahertz and what is that, what does that come out to be? 1 divided by, um, 1 divided by what? 10 megahertz, uh, 10 meg, correct? And that that means it is 0.1 ppm, 0.1 parts per million that kind of accuracy we are trying to get out of this thing. Okay. One more thing I wanted to uh, share with you before we go forward is a reference for this uh, the PLL part. I found uh, this online reference cppsim.com. It is written by uh, ex MIT professor, his name is Michael Perro. And if you go into this website, you will get lot of material there, uh, very useful. Um, and if you if you really want to do your PhD in this space, you know, you can kind of go through all the slides. Um, and he has written a very nice tool, um, which, which will enable you to kind of get going quickly. You know, because he models everything, all the blocks, and you can choose as we go in the course. You will, uh, you will see. Uh, you can ch make make choices and see the impact um, on uh, on the PLL design. Okay, and more on that as we go along. But this is a good reference. Uh, if you get a chance, you can you can look at that. So PLL by itself uh, is a, is a feedback system. Okay, so let's talk about something that we are very familiar with. Let us take a simple example we are, which we all know. Okay. Let us say this is AS and this is F correct and goes back in plus or minus here. This is our V in let us say if it was V in this is plus and this is minus right. And what is the transfer function for this V out divided by V in S that is equal to Amit 1 plus or minus okay A of S and F okay. So, we all know this right. So, what does really feedback do in uh, we do this all the time when we do op amp design right. Why do we use feedback? Can somebody uh, share Kostu? Let us say we use op amps right. So, we use feedback in op amps, what do we gain out of that? Increase the, mm, there is more fundamental like very first thing you should answer, what is the, what does the feedback do? Huh? Ah, somebody said D, desensitize the gain, yeah. Typically when you design an op amp, the open loop gain right, GMR out or whatever, that is a large number but it is not controllable, it will move all over the place. It could be 10,000, it could be 15,000 whatever, we cannot control that. So, this number when we do something like this and if A is large, then the output will be 1 over F approximately. Okay. And F can be feedback ratio which is done using a resistive divider and things like that. Okay. So, we like to use feedback to get accurate loop gain. Okay. Okay. So, now we will try to do something similar in the PLL domain what is going on right. So, if we look at PLL block diagram, okay. this uh, I am going to I am going to replace each more each thing uh, block by. So, this is one block and this is the block you design. VCO voltage control oscillator okay, which has input which is voltage and output is a large frequency right. 
So, and then we are feeding it back something like this. And this is our reference clock. All right. So, let us see what happens here. So, uh, plus minus part is called phase uh, difference amplifier or phase detector. Okay. So, here we have voltage difference amplifier, here we have phase difference amplifier. So, we look at the incoming phase and uh, the feedback phase and we difference uh, take a difference between those two and we get some error signal and then we amplify using a VCO correct and after amplification the output is fed back again. So, very similar right if you if you look at it this way. So, this was um, uh, I think the original start of this was by D belly uh, says okay the French guy in 1932 that is when it started. Uh, he, um, but this this particular example right um, uh, is if you look at it there is uh, incoming clock and outgoing clock is same right. So, it is a very simplistic um, or the uh, very specific case of a PLL uh, you, uh, where incoming and outgo outgoing is the same thing right. Then you would you might expect why are we even doing this right. Because if, if my reference clock and output clock this is uh, a, you know f out are the same then why am I doing this. So, in this particular case um, you had a reference clock coming in and you wanted all the other clocks on the circuit on the chip or on a, in, a, in a block to lock onto it. You cannot have uh, you know two clocks running uh, independently right. So, that was the purpose here and that is what um, it was used for. So, let us do a little more generic design of the PLL this is called PD ok. So, in this particular case what we are going to do is this is our phase detector ok. So, this is called phi ref and this is phi feedback all right. And then what we are going to do when we compare the two phases let us say uh, you have two, two um, phases coming in like this right. You compare them and then um, if let us say phi feedback is leading or lagging ok. Under either of those conditions we will get some kind of waveform which is like, looks like pulses correct. You are looking at two clocks and if one clock leads the other one then the difference in the phases right. One of them is operating at 0 degrees the other one is at uh, let us say 15 degrees in terms of absolute time reference. Then you will have 15 degrees worth of um, you know difference in the phase in every cycle and that will be represented by some kind of uh, pulse ok. Uh, and you can you can see that if it is exactly 180 degrees then you will have you will get like uh, you know one output if it is right on the money then it will be 0 output and if anything in between you will get some uh, 15 percent uh, of the the range of the thing right ok. So, this uh, I cannot put it directly into the VCO. I mean you can, but what will happen is that for the VCO will keep moving around. On an average you will get the same result ok. However, what you do is you filter this out generally ok. You, you take it and you push it through a low pass filter ok. Let us say the transfer function of the filter is H of S. And then what you are going to get is you are going to get some waveform which looks like this filtered out completely ok. And that is something that we will feed it to our VCO. And when you you will get phi out and that is phi out I am going to take it back. Instead of feeding it directly to the phi feedback I am going to use a divider n ok and then I am going to connect it back here all right and I am going to come to the divider. So, what does divider do? It takes the clock waveform coming in and it just takes and it just divides we, we feed feed this divider with some number divide by 2, divide by 4, divide by 4, 8 whatever you want to and it will give you a divided waveform which looks like this ok alright. So, now what happens when the loop is uh, this loop is phase locked let us say when would it be phase locked? When um, phi f b minus phi reference both are function of time that is equal to constant 
okay whenever the difference between the two is constant it doesn't change anymore then we say the loop is phase locked okay the phase may not be the same between the two inputs okay there will be some difference we will get to that but um, I mean this would be the generic case of any phase lock loop right. So now we can say that okay all right so let me differentiate both sides so this would be d phi f b divided by d t is equal to d phi ref divided by d phi ref d t okay all right now what are these this would be f frequency of feedback the same as frequency of reference okay and um, yeah feedback and what is f feedback which is right here and what is the relationship between these two is divided by n right everybody is familiar with the digital divider right i mean you a bunch of d flip flops you feed the feed certain number and once um, you know that count as reach it will start dividing okay so that's what it is so no magic there so f feedback is given by f out divided by n is equal to f ref all right so this is basically what it's going to tell you is f out is equal to n times f ref okay make sense so we get now with this divider we are able to multiply uh, the the reference clock frequency to a very high number okay that's the basic fundamental principle of a phase lock loop now we are going to start um, kind of dig in details and you know every little detail try to add more bells and whistles into every block but this is pretty much what a phase lock loop looks like okay now uh, one more thing is um, the phase lock necessarily means that you have a frequency lock right if this condition is true then definitely this condition is true okay however if this condition is true doesn't necessarily mean that the first condition is true frequency lock doesn't necessarily mean is phase lock because the constant is going to be different right it can be different so reverse is not not generally true just to know now let's go into um, uh, you know we kind of looked at the block diagram level now let's dig into each one of these pieces um, and and see the transfer function for each one of the blocks and try to understand more okay so first thing we're going to talk about is the uh, the phase detector this this particular block okay and and see how uh, we can implement it all right what what does phase detector do it will give you an output whose average value okay is proportional to difference in the phase make sense okay so the block diagram wise it's going to look like this you have a phase detector and you have incoming x1 of t and x2 of t and it will give me x out of t All right and if i plot the transfer function it's going to look like this this is delta phi x1 and x2 and this would be average value okay x out t average value and what we want the transfer function to look like is this something like this okay does that make sense okay all right and now let's look at an example so one example would be xor gate really simple digital uh, circuit and we show it like this what does x what is the transfer function of an xor let's say x1 and x2 and this is your x out and i'm going to draw something like this this is the clock and let's say the other this is x1 of t x2 of t and let's say it comes in later something like this so what do we see 
what does x or do when both are same output is 0 right either 1 or 0 meaning if both are 1 or both are 0 then output is 0 but if they are different then you get some output right. So then in this particular case what you would see is the following you would see a pulse here okay and then you would see another pulse here you would see another pulse here. something like this all right and now uh, so average value of this is going to be the average area under this curve correct. So when I filter it out you will get some DC output which would be the area under this curve and as you can see if I plot the transfer function what would that look like let us see. So if, uh, if the phase difference between them is and the frequencies are of course same is, is 0 then what, what would you get they will be right on top of each other. So both positives will line up and both uh, negatives will line up also right. So you will have 0 x out okay and this would be our delta phi and let us say if it is 90 degrees okay that means if they are two like this and it is halfway you will get certain value and that would probably looks like this and if it is 180 degrees then what would happen they are completely out of phase which means all the time you are going to get one, one output okay. So then you will get something like this correct and now it starts moving forward then what will happen would it start increasing or decreasing it will start decreasing right now basically it is like you have completed one cycle. Um, for the clocks you cannot distinguish that this is the first edge or second edge it will it is blind to that so so you will start seeing something like this okay and then you will see a transfer function that looks like this is this part clear the transfer function part huh? yeah no you vco is running at very high frequency right generally um, so um, what happens I mean uh, so let me repeat the question Shiva asked hey um, all this stuff is fine but what if the VCO is a sinusoidal right uh, then then what happens to the phase detector and all that good stuff right. So typically what you do is you take this VCO output okay and first you run it through a divider analog dividers okay because this run this is running at 5 gigahertz uh, we may not be able to get a good digital divider running at that frequency. Okay, so you do it go through analog divider you shift it down maybe 1 gigahertz and then after that the digital dividers can take over. Okay. So the digital divider um, you know it is just 1s and zeros at that point it is CMOS logic levels. So by the time it comes after that divider when it comes to phase detector it will be all digital sync because we are looking at a very low frequency signals okay, 26 megahertz or something whatever reference clock coming. So this part is happening at a digital level in low frequency digital stuff. Did I answer your question? You got it, right? No, you don't seem convinced. Yeah, that is uh, conversion, right? I mean, it's just converting analog to digital. Not a big deal. It's just a limiter. You know, you take a sinusoidal input and you figure out the DC first of all, sinusoidal input, and then you just have a threshold comparator, pretty much, and then you just get one or a zero, one or a zero. That's all it does. Schmidt trigger may be not a good idea because Schmidt trigger will have a hysteresis generally right. So you do not want to use Schmidt trigger you just have a comparator which will go up and down yeah okay alright. So this let us draw the this is my uh, maximum output VDD let us say and this would be 0 and then this would be what it would be this phase difference will be huh? 180 degrees so let us call it. 180 and this would be 360 and after that it repeats the repeating part is clear right okay. Now um, so this is what is 180 degrees in uh, radians pi or 2 pi pi okay. So this is pi radians and this would be 2 pi got it okay. So um, how do we model this in a block right. So we can say the gain of phase detector what is the gain of the phase detector is delta v divided by delta phi and let us call this k p d phase detector. What is the delta v here in this case? Hmm? 
VDD, right? They go from 0 to VDD and for that how much phase difference do we put in? Pi, okay. So this is the, basically we can model your phase detector like this. And then we can, when we, when we show the phase detector, we generally can, you can show like this. This is K, P, or D. And this would be a voltage output. Okay. So this is phase reference coming in. And this would be phase from the feedback part coming in. Okay. And you will take a difference between these two. And then you would have a gain which will be KPD, which is given by VDD divided by pi. For this particular case, it will be different for a different type of phase detector. So far everything clear? Okay. Let's move on to the next block. Hmm. Output of the, oh, hold on that. I mean, um, uh, you are trying to get inside the VCO right now. Right now I am trying to do block level picture. Okay. Uh, so at block level picture, let's let's not bring the buffers in. But generally, every VCO will have lots of buffers because that VCO has to supply variety of clock sources like receive path. Uh -huh. Feedback? Are you talking about this part here? This part? Uh -huh. uh, what do you think? No, no. I'm asking you. What do you think? Uh -huh. Not required. If I connect the divider directly to the VCO output, what will happen when you look in? Bunch of load, right? Load capacitances and things like that. And if I connect it to some other places, what will happen? You will be sending this to local, uh, your receive path, transmit path, everywhere, right? What will happen? What does each one of these represent? A capacitance, right? And if there is a capacitance that comes in, and it's non-linear because depending upon what you use, what will happen to your VCO frequency? It will change a lot, right? So then do you think you will require a buffer? Why not? Because this also represents some loading, clock, everything, right? Yeah, and it's non-linear loading because that, that the, as the digital or the whatever is connected, as it's switching, it will represent nonlinear. So, excellent question, um, Mishraji, right? He asked, um, your VCO is like your fort. It has to be inside a fort. You don't let anyone come close to your VCO. It's like you have to protect, um, protect that uh, with a fort, right? So, you don't let anybody from outside from the layout point of view. I mean, you have to fight your turf when you are working on an SOC. You don't let any digital guy come close to your VCO area, keep out area and I mean it's like you have to be passionate about the VCO design to do that. So because what happens is that if anything gets into your VCO, right, um, your head is on the line and then you can fix it unless you can model it, right. So it becomes very difficult to fix those things. So it's better to take precautions and not let anybody comes, come inside uh, around your VCO. Uh, so also it goes without saying that then the VCO core part, the L part and the C part, right. Uh, both of them should be, uh, you know, not connecting to the outside world, okay. Because if you have loading, any loading coming into that capacitance, the frequency will change. So you have to keep it kind of as independent as possible. And for example, people will go to the extent that they leave the buffers on all the time. Do you get my point? It's, let's say this VCO has bunch of buffers. Now if I start switching these buffers, what will happen? This is the core part of the VCO which has L and C, right. So you don't want that to change the loading on your VCO so that uh, it doesn't get disturbed. The second part, I mean, which we didn't talk about, I think we did talk about, right, what the supply part that's coming to the VCO, there also you put a regulator so that nobody else can come in from that end. You know, any, any point of uh, contact to the VCO core circuit, you don't want uh, them to come in and disturb you. And also you have to protect your substrate as a result of which you do lots of things to protect your VCO, okay. So good point, it kind of brought out one of the concerns, right. Um, so this part, everything, uh, you know, nobody uh, allows the LC part of your tank to be touched by anything else. Um, you have to have buffers and only after the buffers you can do the division, okay. And anyway, this, this load, the divider is not that much. So you can attach it to the, one of the dividers you already, uh, not dividers, buffers you have. 
coming back to where we were. So, what did we do so far? So far we did uh, the phase detector, uh, how does the phase detector model look like and how do you implement a phase detector, very uh, zeroth order phase detector, okay. The next part is the loop filter. So, loop filter basically uh, extracts the, the DC, okay, out of the phase detector output. So, if you have this as your input, then you want uh, filter output coming out to be you know it should be somewhere somewhere like this okay so you're going to filter it out however you will see that yeah i mean you will have some kind of uh, you know pulses going in because the filter is not perfect okay that's what will happen so you have to um, so simplest form of loop filter would be um, just take a rc filter let's say we denote it like this h of s VPDT and what would be the transfer function in this case? H of S would be one divided by. Huh? S domain, we are doing everything in S domain, 1 plus S R 1 C, okay, all right, good, okay, all right. So, next part after this will be the frequency divider. So, frequency divider, if you draw the block, it looks like this, you have N is the count. This would be your input, output, okay. So, I mean this you should be all familiar with. You have the high frequency clock coming in and then you, when you divide by, let us say divide by n is equal to 4, then you would just say, okay, let me count this, something like this, okay. So, this is your output and this would be for n equal to 4, all right. So, in time domain what are we getting? F out is equal to 1 divided by n F in t correct. So, we want to go back to phase right because we were dealing with phases. So, phase F out a phi out would be in time domain what would that be? Integral of minus infinity to t and of this right f out t tau d tau what am i missing this is frequency in hertz and what is this phase in yeah so you have to put 2 pi here 2 pi f okay so that would be uh, 2 pi f out is 1 over n, f in tau d tau, so that you would get uh, 1 divided by n times phi n, is that clear? So, phi out is equal to 1 over n phi in, I mean obvious result of course. So, in the block diagram sense, what, what can you say? You have 1 divided by n and this is your phi in t and you will get phi out t which is equal to 1 over n phi in t, okay, block diagram. Next thing is uh, voltage control oscillator. Any questions on this part? Straightforward? Okay. Okay. VCO. So, VCO we will kind of go back to what we learned in the last few lectures. What do we have in the VCO? We have a resistor, we have inductor, we have a capacitor. And then we have another resistor which is minus Rp and this is your Rp, L and C and then uh, this C is variable and we are looking at the voltage across this right V, okay. And this is what we say you will get this and the characteristics of the VCO what we saw was let us say this is the v, v tune or V input um, 
we saw that you will have some kind of curve, something like this. It won't be linear, okay? And then um, in your VCO design also, you will see this. And we say that this is our center frequency when V in is equal to V bias, some kind of V bias, okay? And uh, generally, you go from you know zero to VDD. And generally, you don't go very close to zero, or you don't go very close to VDD, because you know there is a lot of noisy stuff around there. So you try to stay away from those two regions. All right. So um, what is really going on? What is um, we have? This is our FVCO. This slope at each point is going to move slightly. And that's the KVCO you are will be designing for, okay, in your thing. So this slope is um, let's here call KVCO prime. Okay. So what's the equation now? F out T is equal to K prime VCO. Sorry. Uh, times V input T. So if input V tune or V input, if it goes high, then the VCO frequency goes high. That really depends, it does not matter, you know, if you have inversion or not, okay. So we can say that the phi out of T is equal to integral minus infinity to T, 2 pi times F out T d tau d tau, which is equal to, what is that equal to? 2 pi bring it out and f out is equal to k vco. So, we will bring out both 2 pi k prime vco and integral of 0 to uh, t minus minus infinity to t of v in tau d tau. Are you with me on this equation? Straightforward. So, if I go in s domain now, uh, what will we get? Phi out of s is equal to 2 pi k prime vco. And what is this? What does this represent in S domain? Integration, right? So, integration in S domain is 1 over S, okay? All right. So, this would be Vn of S divided by S. All right. So, we can say that I'm going to rewrite this part. That's the reason I was using K prime. I can say this is my KVCO, just a change of uh, variable. And we can draw the VCO like this. What's the input coming in is V in T, and this is multiplied by KVCO divided by S, okay, and the output is your phi out T. All right. Now the interesting thing begins, right? So let's put everything together. What was the first thing we did? Phase difference. So we had a phi reference, T coming in, and then this is our plus minus. What was the first block? K P D phase detector gain, right? And then we said there is a filter which is H of S, and then we push it to a VCO. What is VCO? K V C O divided by S. All right, and this is what we bring it back. And what's in the divide here? You're going to get divide by N. All right, and this is our phi out. Phi N. This is phi divider. Let's say, and we can say this is phi error, and this one we can say V P T. This is V. FT, okay, something like that. Okay, all right. So all I did was I took each individual blocks and we we put it all together. Uh, KPD is a constant. H of S is your filter a transfer function. K VCO divided by S is the VCO. Right, this is what VCO represents. Okay. So I mean you have done all these different different transfer functions in variety of classes, right? But this one is a little bit unique. So I would like you to pay careful attention. Uh, what is the incoming um, variable coming in? Phase. What is the error variable? 
space what is variable over here voltage right variable here is voltage and then we, we got back to phase again okay so uh, keep that in mind when you go around in the phase lock loop right because this can be confusing if you just draw the block diagram and if you don't really pay attention um, you're trying to figure out where is this s coming from all that stuff right? that's why i wanted to go step by step and make sure you appreciate the fact that you're you're changing domains okay you're going from phase to frequent uh, phase to voltage and voltage to phase again okay is that clear so pay that uh, pay close attention to that when you draw that and that's the reason we draw the transfer function in this fashion so what's the any feedback loop what's the most important thing you worry about huh? stability right your feedback loop the thing should not go haywire so uh, for stability what's we, st we start with loop gain first so let's look at the loop gain okay what is loop gain here let's call it lg huh? start talking kpd times kvco divided by s and 1 divided by n times h of s okay i just rearranged the terms for convenience okay now in this particular case there is only one integrator s so this is called type 1 because there is only one integrator in the loop all right if there is only one integrator in the loop okay all right now closed loop transfer function that would be what would that be kpd uh, times kvco divided by s um, and h of s right the a part and then 1 plus a um, af right divided by 1 plus kpd times kvco divided by s and then h of s divided by n and what is this transfer function representing phi out of s divided by phi in of n phi sorry phi in which is phi reference okay so we can represent this as uh, g of s okay i want to just rewrite this so that it looks more equal to kpd kvco h of s divided by s plus uh, kpd kvco h of s divided by n that's our transfer function now if i use um, h of s let's say if i for, for the filter if i just use this part r and c what would be the h of s now we said h of s will be equal to 1 over 1 plus s divided by omega lpf and this would be equal to 1 over r1 c1 right okay so let's substitute that and then let's see what we get so g of s will be equal to uh, kpd kvco uh, 1 divided by 1 plus s divided by omega lpf divided by s plus kpd kvco and uh, divide by n 1 divided by 1 plus s omega lpf so we can solve it um, we can yeah we can just bring it over here and that would become uh, kpd uh, kvco divided by s plus s square divided by omega l you're following me right all i'm doing is i'm just simplifying this this would be kpd uh, kvco divided by n now we can uh, i want to make bring it into s square format this is the conventional format that we are used to so this will become um, kpd kvco omega lpf divided by um, s square i'll bring this over here plus omega lpf times s correct and then plus 
KPD KVCO divided by n times omega LPF. Is this clear? I am just rewriting the expression. Now we uh, kind of uh, try to, this looks like a familiar equation, right? Second order equation. Um, and uh, you, we can compare this to uh, expression which looks like this, which is you all know S square plus 2 zeta um, omega n s plus omega n square. We want to get into that format so that we can start predicting how it's going to behave. This is a closed loop expression, right? So, second order closed loop. What is omega n? Omega n is the natural frequency of this particular uh, PLL. So, omega n is equal to this. So, which would be omega n uh, is equal to square root of KPD KVCO divided by n omega LPF. And then we can say that 2 times zeta omega n is equal to omega LPF. I am just equating this with this for equivalence and then we can derive what is this uh, damping factor. This is the damping factor, right? Zeta. Zeta is equal to 2 omega n. So, you have to take this out there and it will look like this half of uh, square root of n omega LPF divided by KPD and KVCO. So, this is our damping factor. Okay. So, this function, this is a closed loop transfer function and on top you are going to get n times omega n square. Okay. This is, if you look at it, um, yeah. Uh, this is this is your omega n square. So, this is equal to n times omega n square. So, this is the tra transfer function which is closed loop transfer function phi out divided by phi in. All right. So, why is this important? This means that if I do a step change at the input, you know, how does the, how does it go to phi out the final output? Okay. So, uh, a second order system, you know, you must have done this in control systems. If uh, the damping factor is uh, critically damped. Are you familiar with critically damped? So, uh, so what, what is that number? Do you remember by any chance? 1 over root 2, right? That's the, uh, that's the critical damping factor, 0 0.707, okay? So, what happens is the following. Let us say I provide a, um, a step, okay? If I provide a phase step, phi in is a, so if it is uh, under damped, what will happen? Damp, what does damping mean? Okay, something is vibrating and you put paper weight on it, that is or you put a wet cloth on it, it stops, right? You kind of think like that damping factor, it will, it will kind of stop shaking, right? So, in this particular case, you, you put a step and if it is under damped, which means it is not damped, then what will happen? You will it will, it will keep buzzing around, right? So, you will see a transfer function that looks like this. You will go pretty quickly and then it will keep doing this, right? Something like this. This may not be a good idea because when you are changing channel from one channel to another channel, you want it to go from one frequency to another frequency in the smoothest, fastest fashion without any overshoots, undershoots, okay? And same thing is especially true when you are transmitting something, okay? Because when you are transmitting, you want to go from one frequency to another frequency without going into any other range, right, as quickly as possible. Generally, there is a specific time given to go from one state to another state in all the transceivers, okay. So, that is the reason. So, this is the under damped, res under damped response. And what is over damping? Meaning, if you put, put like a big rock on top of something that is fluttering, it will just stop I mean, it will really struggle to move. Then what happens? You get response that looks like this. It is taking forever. And the critically damped one is going to look like something like this. It should be 1 over root 2. This particular, this particular zeta. Okay? All right. So, 1 over root 2 will give you this kind of response which will be perfect. And if it is anything above less, you will get corresponding response. All right. 
So um, quickly I want to go through uh, you know this analogy uh, of the PLL um, when you I mean you are used to if you did uh, uh, the previous class right uh, CMOS class we had an op amp and we had a feedback okay. So if this is V in of T okay and let us say this is V out of T. And if let us say V in changes over here, the V out will obviously change, okay. However, it will be um, if your open loop gain of the op amp is large, the you will have uh, you will have uh, output track input, but there will be some error, it will not be perfect because of the gain, uh, gain is you know not infinite, okay, in this particular case. And um, so your V out t will not be equal to v in t but it will track okay so if we look at the pll the same way the one that we did just now okay you have phi reference and uh, phi out t okay you will see that it will track but there will be always difference, phase difference and I am going to get into that so that you have a feel for why this happens, okay. Uh, just like it happens in the op amp. So, phi out T minus phi ref is constant, okay, but it tracks basically phi ref, uh, phi out will track phi ref, okay. Um, one other way to understand that if you if you look at uh, the VCO implementation right, if you if you see you have V tune, physical significance of this is and you have omega out okay and let us say this is behaving like this, Some this is our K VCO curve. Uh, so um, let us say you were at frequency and you are going to this frequency okay this is V1 and this is V2 and the corresponding frequency over here will be omega 1 and omega 2, okay. So, you will have a delta F here, a delta omega let us say and you will have a delta V here that you are applying, okay. So, we are we are applying a step and what will happen in the phase detector, uh, if you look at the VPD phase detector, you will have this. Okay. So, you will have delta phi 1 initially and then you are going to delta phi 2. You will go from V1 to V2. I am just showing you how things are going to look correspondingly. What this is the VCO characteristic, circuit characteristic, characteristics where you change the voltage and the frequency changes, right, all right. And then this is the phase detector characteristics where you change the phase and the voltage changes. And this is what is being fed over here if you will, make sense, okay. So then delta phi 2 minus delta phi 1 is going to be equal to delta omega divided by KPD times KVCO, does that make sense in terms of phase difference, okay, all right. The other thing I wanted to show you. Um, because it is kind of a uh, little bit difficult in the beginning to wrap your head around uh, because you are so comfortable with either doing with the dealing with voltages or currents and now suddenly we are talking about phases, right, yeah. Which one? The second one? Second one is basically uh, what I am, what am I plotting? I am plotting the phase difference, okay. This is the transfer characteristics of the, fa uh, of, the uh, of the phase detector, correct. Um, maybe I should show you one more, yeah, let me just show you the block diagram again, okay. Let us look at it this way, this will, will be clear. So we are talking about the transfer characteristics of this and then we are talking about transfer characteristics of this. We know the transfer characteristics of the VCO, right. What happens when you input voltage changes from V1 to V2, the output frequency and phase changes from omega 1 to omega 2, right, makes sense. Now correspondingly. Okay, if uh, so, the assumption is that I am providing a step at the input. Okay, and if I provide the step, step is not a voltage step. 
but uh, frequency step at the input. You are going from frequency, um, uh, reference frequency from A to B let us say as a step. Then what will happen is the phase detector will give you, originally your phase detector was giving you delta phi 1 which was giving you V1. Okay, I think uh, let me, let me, uh, you are, you are understanding the block diagram now, right. Can I show the characteristics now so that it will be clearer that way. So all I am doing is I am showing you characteristics of this and characteristics of this. And when I make a change in the phase, uh, in the frequency, I am trying to show you uh, how each block is, is moving on that characteristics, transfer function of each one of them. Okay, so that is what I am trying to do. So what I am trying to show you is the following in this particular case. Let us say I change uh, phi ref uh, from um, such that the VCO changed um, from omega 1 to omega 2. Okay. So VCO output changed from omega 1 to omega 2, correct, after changing phi ref because we know the equation. So then um, to change from omega 1 to omega 2 at the input of the VCO what do you need? V1 and V2. That is clear, right. So I need to have V1 and V2. So we moved let us say from V1 to V2 at the input of the VCO, okay. Where is that coming from? That is coming from the output of the phase detector. And what is the phase detector characteristics? Is this one linear, right. So we moved from V1 to V2. So let me draw in red. We are moving from this to this as a result of which the frequency moves from here to here. So here I am going from V1 to V2, right. So as a result of which we are moving from delta phi 1 to delta phi 2. Originally there was a delta phi 1 difference and now we move to delta phi 2 difference, okay. So which means that the two clocks coming in originally had a delta phi 1 difference. They were not 0 is the point I am trying to make because if it was 0 then the VCO would be always at the center frequency, okay. So you had certain delta phi 1 in the uh, difference in the big wind and then when we move to different frequency it will go to delta phi to the So, so it kind of rather than just looking at a block diagram, it is kind of good to analyze what is really happening inside. And I am going to show you one more picture which will kind of uh, make sense um, related to this exact same thing, okay. So let me show you the curve, uh, the picture, okay. So let us look at this. this, this picture is from Razavi. So I thought it would be uh, very useful to understand. Again I am showing the same exact thing except that I do not have a divide by n here in between, okay, which is okay for the sake of understanding. So what is going on here? Uh, the input clock V in is given here, okay. So uh, the first dotted line, um, if you look at V in curve, right, before the dotted line there was certain omega 1 and after the dotted line what happened is I changed the frequency, input frequency to omega 1 plus delta omega, right. So you can see the edges are appearing faster in the uh, V in. All right. So V out what will happen? V out was originally locked with certain um, these pulses that you are seeing, the first two pulses and they were fixed and they gave you certain phase error and it gave you certain, uh, certain voltage at the input of the VCO which gave you certain frequency, right. Now as the, uh, the V out will continue to work like that, right, because the input to the VCO has not changed yet, all right. And as V in clock frequency increase, what will happen? It will, it's fa the pulses will become smaller and smaller. So you can see on top the pulses are becoming, pulse width is becoming smaller and smaller because of the delta omega part. So immediately you can see the phase difference is increasing. Do you see that in the VPD, the, 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 the pulse width is increasing, do you see that? I mean maybe I can show you over here, if you see here right, the pulse width is increasing, okay. If the pulse width increases then what happens? You can see the DC at the filter output is increasing, okay, okay. So if it increasing, it will keep going and this part will be decided by the transfer characteristics of that loop. If it is critically damped, under damped, over damped, whatever. So in this particular case, is it critically damped or under damped or over damped? What do you see? It is under damped because it is overshooting. Do you see that it overshoots the desired frequency? It goes up and then eventually it will come down after a few things and you will see that it will settle to value such that 
the final value omega out is correct out here and the difference is going to be delta omega divided by k v, uh, k v c o what else is there this is more that is it ok. So, is this uh, I mean this is like live uh, things happening and it is kind of fun to watch when you simulate this too. Uh, so, uh, the, the, the main thing that you have to understand is on one side you are looking at phases and second half of the circuit you are looking at voltages ok. So, you have to keep that in mind ok. Huh? What is it? What do you think? No, but guess no. You have three choices, you can pick one. Underdamped, why? No, all of it will work, but what will happen to the lock time? The settling time will be larger, right? Because you will overshoot, it will come back, and that is what I said. You want it to be critically damped so you get the best, fastest possible, and quickest possible. Um, uh, thing and same thing when you do. Uh, so, uh, I mean, this is absolutely no different than op amp phase margin, ok. When you do phase margin of the op amp, you would put it in such a way that it is about 70, 72 degrees, right, the phase margin. So, then the then it would settle like a, in a critically damped fashion. When you apply the input step, the output will quickly settle to the right value. Same thing you do in your A2D converter when you are sampling between the two sides. You, you want to make sure you quickly reach that final value so that you can increase the sampling rate as much as you can, ok, alright, ok. So, so let us go back to our uh, original um, thing, I want to take it further. So the type 1 PLL what we talked about is, um, um, what did we say what type 1 PLL has in the open loop transfer function? We have um, one integrator. only one integrator and where does that integrator come from? From the VCO in the transfer function ok due to VCO. So, the phi ref and phi divider R and C and we are talking about this phase error ok. So, let us say that something like this, this is your VCO frequency and this is V tune, V tune is the voltage that is applied over here ok. So, this would be this would be your uh, when V tune is right in the middle ok because you will go from 0 to maybe VDD and right in the middle is your um, center frequency ok. So, as F ref changes as we discussed right, the phase error has to increase or decrease ok. That part we just talked about to provide this DC voltage which has to change up and down over here ok to get the right frequency in this type 1 PLL, alright, so, huh. correct, correct, yeah, yeah. So, what happens is um, we linearize everything, you know, around that point and we are making delta changes, small changes around that. So, for the sake of discussion, you can use the linear model, but you are absolutely right. If you make a really large change, then your KVCO will all dynamically change along with it, ok. But for purpose of analysis, we are saying we are linearizing around that point. That is why I drew that slope, ok. But absolutely, uh, um, you know, you are absolutely right that KVCO is not linear. So, we are not worried about the linearity of the KVCO as much as we are in paranoid in digital, uh, in, uh, in the ADC design or things like that, right. We just want it to be monotonic and we just want it to be fairly linear. Uh, but there is no requirement like, you know, it has to be so linear uh, that our PLL is not going to work, ok. Okay. So, one thing that uh, what is the kind of uh, the insight that I wanted to give you was you always have finite static phase error and this depends on the input frequency. I hope this point is clear 
why do you have finite static phase error? Because we went through a few examples, right? Uh, so input uh, frequency dependent. Okay. Uh, so if you have finite static phase error, right? Which means that what will be the waveform that you will see here? If you have finite static phase error, if there is a static phase error, which means two waveforms are not lined up, right? So at the output, what would you see? Absolutely, is right. So you would see pulses. So if you take a pulse and you feed it through RC filter, what would you get? You will get some ripple on it, right, all the time, no matter what you do, correct? So you will, he, out here, you are going to get a, on the V-tune, you will have ripple on the V-tune. In this particular architecture, okay, all right. Now, so if there is a ripple on V-tune, then we know that we really do not want ripple on the, at the input of the VCO. So you want it to be really, really filtered very well. So to filter it out, what do you have to do? Huh? Decrease the that RC filter pole you want to, you want to reduce omega LPF, right? That is what you are, you are trying to push it as low as possible. So what you want is omega LPF. To reduce this ripple, you want it to be drawn as little uh, low as possible. So if we do that, however, let us look at our equation, that the simplest equation we did. What does that tell you? If I drop omega LPF to reduce my V tune, right, uh, V tune ripple, what will happen? The damping factor will, will reduce, which means you are going to become under damped then what will happen? You will start getting all those things, okay? Is that clear? So that is the, uh, that is one of the issues that we have with this particular PLL. So this basically um, will impact st stability. As the damping factor is going down, okay? Another thing is, um, uh, if your input and output frequency is too large, okay, then this particular PLL may not lock. The reason for that is this phase detector, right, if you see, you can, if you go beyond the, the 2 pi, right, you can get into, I mean, you can kind of exercise your, uh, yourself and see that you will, you can get into a pattern where it would lock. It can lock onto the multiple frequencies of uh, uh, you know, 5 in, uh, 5 reference, right? If you have, so, so, and purely because of this phase detector um, response. So, um, these are the problems with the type 1 PLLs. I just wanted to show you, share with you that. So, how do we fix it? So, we go to the next layer, okay? Uh, we'll start with the type 2 PLL next uh, uh, Tuesday, right? Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Have a good weekend.